coming up next on Arizona Horizon. We'll look at efforts to limit the number of concussions among high school athletes. A recent poll shows Sheriff Joe Arpaio with his lowest approval ratings to date. And we'll visit the most energy efficient fire station in the valley. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Another high school football season starts this week and with it an increased chance that some of those on the playing fields will suffer concussions. New efforts were announced today to try to slow down the rate of concussions among high school athletes. The new regulations were put in place by the Arizona Interscholastic Association and a new video game aimed at educating kids about concussions is being launched by the Arizona Cardinals. Joining me now is Dr. Javier Cardenas, a nationally known concussion expert from Barrow Neurological Institute at St. Joseph's Hospital. We also welcome Tamara McLeod, professor in the athletic training program at A.T. Still University in Mesa. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Let's start with defining terms here. What is a concussion? So a concussion is a, a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and as mild traumatic brain injuries, you can have alteration of consciousness. In fact, you don't have to lose consciousness in order to have a concussion. And it's really a dysfunction of brain physiology. Um, there aren't any changes to the structure, but the function really uh, is the problem. Uh, the symptoms, headaches, um, dizziness, are some of the most common physical ones. But then there are sleep problems, as well as uh, trouble with academics. And trouble with concussions, is it the one-time big hit? Is it a succession of smaller hits? How do you know when you're getting in trouble here? Sure, I, I, I think the, after the first one, um, you definitely need to be concerned. We don't really know currently if it's uh, one large hit or a magnitude of, of smaller number of repeated blows over time that's going to cause the problem. But once an athlete has been diagnosed with a concussion, we need to take the proper steps to make sure that the concussion is managed and then they can return to sports and school safely. How do you diagnose a concussion more specifically? Or how do you know this sure. is it? It's really based off the clinical presentation and the signs and the symptoms that the athlete reports, which is why educating parents, athletes, and coaches is so important. Have those signs and symptoms changed? We see now on the sideline after a big hit, the, the, we see trainers gathered around someone, they're talking to them, they're doing all sorts of things. What are they doing and how has that changed? So, so they're looking at different areas. So the, the changes of concussion uh, are largely in the physical realm, the behavioral realm, and the cognitive realm. So in the physical realm, indeed, balance uh, is one of the things that's being tested on the sidelines. Uh, headaches are another one, but they're subjective, so you're asking them about uh, headaches. Um, other things that they're checking in terms of cognition are thinking skills, memory, um, looking at, uh, at numbers, and repeating things. What kind of follow-up, though? Let's say that you get hit, you go to the sidelines, you can count to 10, you can balance, you can do all sorts of things. You wake up tomorrow, you got a headache, it's hard to get out of bed, you're not sure what's going on. Are there follow-up examinations? There definitely should be, and that, I think, is the key to proper concussion management because some of the symptoms uh, may not uh, present immediately at the time of the injury. Sometimes we see personality changes, sadness, irritability. Um, a lot of things that parents might notice in their children's personality three, four, five days after the injury. So any sign or symptom of a concussion, the athlete should be seen by a qualified medical provider. Does that change between kids and adults? You say three, four, five days. Could it be weeks? Could it be months? It most definitely could be. Um, there are some cases where uh, concussion symptoms might last uh, over a month, um, and that's where we really need to start thinking about managing uh, the student as a student in the classroom. And so we need to have increased awareness among teachers um, as well as healthcare providers. And we've, we've talked a lot about concussions, and even on this program, we've discussed CTE. I'll let you define CTE yeah. and tell us what it stands for. But what are we talking about here, and how serious is this? So, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is, is a disorder we've actually known for a while. Um, in, in boxers, um, when you see, you see an individual, there's, there's slug nutty, um, there's punch drunk in terms of their clinical presentation. And the definitions um, are, are actually there. There's usually three stages. One is a change in personality. Um, a second is a, abnormal movements. And then the third is what's considered a Parkinsonism, in which they have Parkinson's-like features and they have to, uh, tend to have a decline in their function. Can it be something as simple as, I, I'm, I'm forgetting where I'm leaving the keys, I don't have any idea what I had for dinner last night, everything else is fine, memory is shot. Is, can it be something that simple? Uh, in many cases, it could be, especially the early stages of this disorder. But um, 
many people will think that they have it when in fact their, their memory might actually be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the evaluation process is, is critical. Uh, many people, when they start having problems, then they look back at their history and they say, well, you know, one time I, I fell off my bike and I, and I hit my head. It's, it's very unlikely that that single event caused the problem as opposed to re repeated uh, trauma to the brain. And is this something that could, let's say you, you've played your sports, you've retired, you've raised your family, you've done all sorts of things, now later in life all of a sudden these kinds of symptoms, can they pop up out of nowhere or is it a steady climb or do we even know? I'm not sure that we necessarily know at this point. Um, the studies that are out about CTE are case series, retrospective in nature, so um, we haven't been able to look forward in time and follow someone uh, from a high school or a collegiate career through their professional career and then on through retirement. And I know that there are centers that are starting to look at that, but we don't have those answers yet. Yeah, so a lot of question marks still out there Most on definitely. this. definitely. And, and, and indeed, you, you hear about athletes and these, these terrible stories of these people these that gave their lives to football, and 40s, 50s, they're just losing it all. Yet most of these athletes don't seem to be suffering from CTE. How do, how do we know? So there are clearly a number of factors. Um, in addition to the, the trauma to the brain, um, there are genetic factors, there are an environmental factors, um, there are a number of issues. Right now we have point A, which is trauma to the brain, concussion, and then we have point B, CTE, and there's a whole lot in between that we simply don't understand. The genetic factors and the environmental factors, do we have any ideas? Um, with some, I mean, there, there are some studies looking at other forms of traumatic brain injury. Uh, those who have uh, two copies of the APOE4 allele, which is also seen in Alzheimer's, there's a body of literature that shows that those people actually do very poorly in traumatic brain injury. Now, it's incomplete data, but this just suggesting that there are other factors involved in this problem. And in, in layman's terms here, I, I'm trying to compare dementia, Alzheimer's, CTE. Give us an overview. So the issue with CTE is there are specific changes to the brain that are seen in our microscope. Now, like Alzheimer's, um, it can't be diagnosed with somebody alive. It has to be a diagnosed post-mortem. Um, the changes that people see in CTE um, include uh, microscopic changes. They're, they're called neurofibrillary tangles um, and, and beta amyloid changes um, to the brain, brain as well. Um, that are uh, seen on the gross pathology and microscopic pathology of the brain. So you can see some of these things early, but boy, CTE, it's, it's, it's still a little guesswork out there. There, there is a, a lot of guesswork, yeah. uh, actually. Um, and, and as we see more and more athletes donating their brains to science, um, we're starting to get a better understanding. But once again, this whole middle piece about you know, what takes somebody from this kind of injury to CTE, we, we still need to uh, research. So what's an athlete to do? What's a young athlete to do? What's the parent, the coach, the trainer of a young athlete to do? Sure, I think the best thing they can do is become educated on what are the signs and symptoms of a concussion. They should learn what resources are available to them in the community to help them um, so that there are qualified healthcare providers that, that their child can see. Um, for those that are at a high school, um, the parents should be meeting the athletic trainer that's employed by the high school and having a good relationship there so that there's an open line of communication if there's an injury. Is there more of that happening, do you think, now than there has been in the past? I think there's definitely more awareness, awareness and a lot of it are the initiatives that the AIA has instituted with the mandate of the educational program. Let's talk about the AIA. What, what kind of mandates, are, first of all, how are they responding to this? And secondly, are they responding enough? Um, actually, you know, in Arizona, we're, we are taking the lead in this particular issue. Across the country, just about every state now has, uh, has legislation and policy, and the policy is largely in three parts, education, removal from play, and return to play uh, procedures. Um, the educational mandate simply, in most cases, is, is signing a piece of paper saying, I understand concussion is bad. What we've done is we've created an educational module in collaboration with the Arizona Cardinals and the AIA called Barrow Brain Book. We launched it in August 2011, and since then we've had over 180,000 kids complete this concussion education. It is a requirement for any high school athlete, regardless of the sport that they play, before they can step onto the field or the court. And, and indeed, it sounds like the Cardinals have also come up with this video game. I think we have some, some excerpts of this thing where basically, because you've got to get a kid's attention here, <laughs> and the yeah. video game shows a, you know, a bunch of helmets hitting each other. 
that is a way to educate kids and parents, is it not? Sure, and there's literature out there that shows using these types of apps and video games is, is good in increasing awareness about concussion. And it's really taking the educational message into a medium that fits um, the, the way that athletes learn today. Yeah. And actually, this particular video game was, um, was a, a grant uh, provided to us, uh, Barrow, by the Fiestable. Um, and the Fiestable is really uh, those who actually funded this program, this initiative, with respect to the uh, Barrow Brain Ball, which is a video game for kids 8 to 12. So l let's, let's get to the bottom line of what parents need to know, and again, coaches and trainers. What do they need to know that they may not, not, not know now? And with all the question marks out there, what can they know? I think the biggest thing is just to understand the immediate signs and symptoms, to have a conversation with their child about being truthful should they ever um, have some of those signs and symptoms after participating in sport, and then to seek out a qualified medical professional, the athletic trainer at the secondary school being the, the person who is probably most well-versed in concussion that they have immediate access to. Coaches and trainers, what do they need to know, and uh, is there some resistance? Well, so uh, coaches, athletic trainers, parents, teachers should know in the state of Arizona there are an incredible wealth of resources. One, we have Barrel Brain Book, so uh, any parent should be asking their kids about it. The coaches should also be asking their kid about it. We have a research registry tracking every, every athlete, um, and they should be involved in that. All the athletic trainers have access to uh, impact baseline testing for every single athlete in the state, and they have access to um, uh, professionals, Barrow professionals uh, who are neurologists, um, to provide concussion consultation remotely. Um, in terms of resistance, um, we're not seeing much of it. In fact, the AA came out with a new policy that, that is implemented this year that says, in practice, you're limiting the amount of uh, contact. And so no more than half of the time during the preseason can be contact practice. No more than a third of the time during the season can be contact practice. And this was actually created in conjunction with the football committee. With that in mind, how, it sounds like it's, it's, it's a maintenance program here and to try to limit concussion. Sports like football, sports like hockey especially, um, is there any way to take this risk and lower it? Do you change the equipment? Do you change the rules? How do you keep the spirit of the game alive and try and protect kids? Sure. Um, you definitely want kids, I think, participating in sport. The message isn't that sports are bad because there's definitely a lot of positives from participating. Um, if we look at football and, and hockey, ice hockey's made some significant rule changes uh, with respect to body checking and increasing the age at which kids can start body checking. Football is doing a lot with technique and teaching coaches how to properly teach tackling technique. And those types of behavioral modifications, I think, are, are definitely an area that continues to, to be, need to be explore, explored. Very quickly, would you want your kid playing football these days? Uh, it, yeah, I think it would be okay as long as um, you know there were people on the sideline who could manage it well. What do you think? My kids like books and instruments. Uh, <laughs> <our kids. laughs> um, that said, um, you know they they'd be able to make that decision, and I'd be supportive. All of right. Them. Well, it's good to have you both here. Thank you so much Thank for joining. You. Thank you. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. A new Rocky Mountain poll by the Phoenix-based Behavior Research Center shows Sheriff Joe Arpaio with the lowest positive approval rating since the poll began tracking Arpaio back in 1996. Jim Haynes of the Behavior Research Center is here to help us crunch the numbers. Good to see you again. Always a pleasure. What was the poll looking at? What question was asked? 
the question was asked was was do you um, do you, do you rate the uh, the job performance of Sheriff Joe Arpaio as excellent, good, only fair, or, uh, fair, poor, or very poor? Um, and then we just looked at excellent and good versus um, poor and very poor, like we always have. And it's the first time since we've been tracking those numbers that his numbers have been in the negative. Indeed, there was 37 percent approved of Arpaio. Uh, that's a historic low. So, what does approved mean? I mean, what? It, it, it well, loosely, it means that they think he's doing a, a, a good job, an excellent or good job. Uh, in, in, in the job to which he was elected. Uh, conversely, 42 percent now say he's doing a poor, very poor job. So, Who was asked and when were they asked? Uh, the the um, um, survey was conducted in July. It was 701 heads of household in Arizona. This was not a voter poll. I want to make that clear. This is this is not a straw poll on whether he can get reelected or right, not. This right. is how the residents of Maricopa County was. Was there a reason you didn't go with registered voters this time? Just heads of households? Is there is there a, a, a uh, reasoning to that? On these job approval polls, uh, we always do them on uh, just just uh, regular heads of household because when we do when we do likelihood to vote or, or likelihood of voting for. Candidate A versus candidate B, obviously, we just go to voters. How much difference between Republicans and Democrats here? I would imagine quite a bit, but uh, you tell me. The, yeah, it definitely breaks along party lines. It breaks uh, uh, where Republicans are, are still uh, on balance favorable to the sheriff. Uh, uh, older people are more favorable. Um, and where younger people are, are, are negative. Democrats and independents are negative, um, and, and clearly um, um, he he gets clobbered in the in the minority community, especially okay. Hispanics. Okay, it's, so that it, his net in the Hispanic community is like minus sixty two percent. A year and a half ago, approval rating was forty nine percent. Now it's thirty seven. A year and a half ago, thirty two percent disapproved. Now it's up to forty two. Are those significant changes? I think they're significant, uh, but going to the core question uh, of does it have, is it any kind of indicator of whether uh, the sheriff can be reelected if he runs for election again? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's an indicator. Do you think that the changing demographics of Arizona, uh, you know, the minorities, young adults, maybe more, maybe, I mean, how does that play into all this? That that I think has some effect. I, the other effect I think that that comes into play is is that the man has been in office for a very long time. Um, there's you know we see this in the last two years of a of a of a eight year run of a president, mm -hmm. eight year run of a governor. People get tired sometimes. Um, He's had a very long run, much more than much more than uh, you know a, those that are limited to two terms. So, uh, you know, I I don't think it would be fair for uh, people to look at this uh, at at these numbers and and say this casts aspersions on on his entire career as sheriff. It, it just means that the more you do, every every time you do something, you're going to pick up some mm -hmm. enemies. Or, or some people that disagree with you. Enemies may be a, too strong a term. Well, yeah, people who are disapprove of your right. approval. Now, did I read this right? You also had a, 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 a poll regarding the president, and it sounded like President Obama's ratings in Arizona were higher than Sheriff Joe Arpaio's ratings in Maricopa County. Is that is that true, or is that am I reading that wrong? Um. Uh, honestly, I can't remember that, but it sounds uh, right. Uh, we we actually this year this uh, this wave we asked about the sheriff statewide, mm -hmm. just because we wanted to see what what people um, outside Maricopa County thought. And in, 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 pre, in previous tracking studies, uh, we've we've um, we, we've and when we have when we talked about those numbers earlier, we're talking about only the Maricopa yes, County indeed. numbers. But we looked at it statewide. He is more popular in rural Arizona than he is in, in Maricopa County. Um, so, uh, 
you know, that I, I think it is possible that, that the president would have been, might have been, would have been more uh, yeah, uh, popular more, yeah. in Arizona than our power is here. Hey, we got about 30 seconds left. Last time you were here, we had numbers regarding Senator John McCain that did not, were not very good for him. A little bounce back, I understand. Uh, a bounce back of about 18 points. My uh, goodness. Uh, uh, an increase in, um, in, in positive ratings of 8% and a decrease in negatives of 10%. I think it goes strict, straight to his uh, leadership in the band, uh, band of, uh, gang of eight. You think so? The immigration reform is really making a difference? People in Arizona support that, and, and they liked his leadership. So it's okay. So we had uh, last time with McCain; those numbers have bounced back. We'll see what happens as far as the sheriff is concerned. Everything's possible. It's always good to see you. Good to see you. In tonight's Focus on Sustainability, we look at efforts by the Goodyear Fire Department to go green. The city of Goodyear was recently honored for its energy efficiency, and the local chapter of the Building Operators Managers Association ranked Goodyear's fire station as the best among nearly 75 Valley public safety facilities. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Stephen Snow tell us more. This was the original station built when we became a full-time fire department versus a volunteer fire department. That was more than 20 years ago, but the memories remain fresh for Battalion Chief Russ Braden. I worked out of the station in 1996 and grew up uh, right across the street over here, less than a half mile away. Goodyear's oldest fire station looks a lot like it did back in 1992, until you look up, way up. It's a foam type roofing with an elastic type coating that uh, have a re reflective quality. And that quality allows for when the sun is shining, it kind of reflects off a lot of the heat so we're not absorbing it. And that kind of keeps the building a lot more cooler and helps the AC units run a lot more efficient. Thanks to federal stimulus funds, facility superintendent Kevin Dobson says they also installed 12 new air conditioning units. We've, um, came up with a lot of innovative ideas on how we can cut down the energy signature here at the fire station. Like installing motion sensor lighting and programmable thermostats. And what they have in them is a temperature range. So if you go in and say, hey, I want to make it cooler or warmer, it locks you out. It won't let you make changes to the thermostat. It's got a base setting and that's what it's locked in. Braden says closing blinds when they don't need natural light saves energy. So does adding layers other times of the year. During the winter time, we used to run the heaters out in the bay out here. Well, we don't run those as much unless it's really, really, really cold now. I mean, we all wear sweatshirts, throw a coat on. As they hit the road to energy efficiency, Braden explained the direction to his crew. You need to think like a homeowner when you're here would you want to pay a bigger power bill so you can just have it to where you have to have a sweatshirt on in the middle of August sitting, you know, sitting in the kitchen? No, you know, we have somebody who has to pay the bills. It's called the taxpayer. So, you know, everything we can do to kind of ease the burden for them, you know, it just makes it better for everybody. With the changes, Goodyear expected to cut costs by 4%. They say they topped that. Over the entire year, we're, we're, we're probably accumulating anywhere from 5 to 8 percent of a saving on our energy costs here. Dobson says that's more than $15,000 a year. The numbers helped Goodyear capture the Kilowatt Crackdown Award from the Building Operators Managers Association. 
but they're not done. We'll have to keep looking at our buildings. We'll have to keep improving what we're doing. Just because you won one time doesn't mean that you're good to go forever. The idea is you continue to find more efficient ways every year. Goodyear also used federal stimulus funds to install new AC units at two other fire stations, a police station, and City Hall. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, the state has its first ever Poet Laureate. I'll talk to Alberto Rios about his new role and his poetry, and we'll find out about a kickoff event to Arizona's SciTech Festival. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.